title of this talk is Lessons Learned Operating Postgres at Scale. Um, I've been using Postgres for nine years. Um, I think my first installation was 8.2, which we upgraded to 8.3 in 2000 and something. Uh, and that was upgrading from an esoteric Perl database called XML comma. If anybody knows about that, that's crazy, but you should come say hi. Uh, and it was backed by MySQL 4. And so this was about a 20 gig database for a content site, very read heavy type of application. Um, and I've been using Postgres ever since. So also I've been at Bearing Tree for five years. Uh, we were acquired by PayPal two and a half years ago. And so the growth trajectory has been fairly insane, to put it mildly. Um, so lots of really fun challenges. Primarily today, I work on uh, application infrastructure scaling at Braintree. Um, but over the years, I've had my hands in lots of different products and whatnot. So uh, yeah, so who is Braintree? We work with all these awesome companies and a lot more. Um, as you can see, many of these are companies you've probably heard about. If you're staying in an Airbnb right now, we probably processed your payment. Uh, if you've taken an Uber, same thing. If you have code on GitHub and a private account, um, et cetera. So at a high level, we make it really easy to accept payments online and in mobile apps. We have some tools that make that you know, range from very drop-in, uh, where you have very minimal code in order to configure your payments experience, uh, or you can go much lower level and really make a kind of handcrafted thing. So, all right. And have to say, disclaimer, these are my views, not those of PayPal or any PayPal subsidiaries. Uh, also, these are based on my experiences. Your mileage may vary. Um, I do promise that I'm being as accurate as I possibly can be, um, but many of you here are much smarter people than I am, and uh, you may have slightly different takes on some of this stuff. So I hope that if you do, you'll come talk to me about it, because I would love to hear. OK, so scale. Um, as we grow our applications, uh, you know, we, our customers grow, we grow, we build new products, um, and eventually I've found that everything tends towards an online operation. Um, I don't remember the last time uh, in my professional career that I've been able to take a maintenance window. Uh, so we spend a lot of time, I think generally as database people, trying to figure out the right ways to you know, make trade-offs between availability for purpose A or availability for purpose B. Uh, I don't want to associate scale with size, even though size does tend to make life more complicated for your database, because you can have all kinds of weird situations. Um, I remember talking to somebody at a conference, it might have been here last year, who ran like very small databases out in the wilderness, and those were eventually synchronized back. So that's a different sort of problem uh, than you have if you're trying to store tens of terabytes of data in a single Postgres database. So really it's about your trade-offs, like what are the resources you have available to you? How do you want to manage them in order to get your work done? So I'm gonna talk about a few different things that, uh, uh, that I've found I have to consider uh, over the years, and hopefully those are things that will be useful for you as well. So first, uh, most people who operate Postgres, like we know that B-tree indexes will bloat over time. So if you have update-heavy tables, uh, for example, let's say you have a table that is uh, a user's table. You have a column that's called something like last page view at, I don't know, if you wanna see most recently active users or something like that. Um, questions of whether that's the right way to store this data aside, you could do that. And then you'd have this one user's table that's super heavily updated. So when you do that, your, uh, the in, if you have an index around that column, it will eventually just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until you re-index it. So as a quick uh, example, if you have, you know, we create a simple table, insert 100,000 records into it. Um, the only column we have is a uh, big in primary key, and I only did that because I was lazy and didn't want to create an index in a separate command. Uh, so we get about a two megabyte index delete 50,000 records, still 2.2 uh, 2 megabytes, 
even if you vacuum this, because the data is sort of skewed throughout the, um, that space. And then you add another 50,000, our index is three megs, re-index, we're back down to two. Um, but note that re-index is not a concurrent operation. So again, if we can't take maintenance windows and we can't say, uh, well, it's all right for me to block writes to this table for some long period of time, re-index is probably not gonna work. You can't create a 100 gig index instantly. That's gonna take a lot of time. Um, of course, if your business permits you to take that downtime, you're a school, you don't mind if somebody is doing work at, on Saturday at 4 a.m., you don't, or you're in financial services, and maybe when the markets are closed, you get to like, have a little more flexibility. You know, maybe you can do that, but I I've, I've, have not really known anybody to use re-index. So um, what we want to do is we want to re-index. First, we're going to monitor our bloat, because that's what we do. And uh, you can use either check Postgres. Um, the Bucardo project uh, has this plugin which outputs in about any format imaginable. I think it's like Nagios, uh, Ganglia, and all kinds of other good stuff. Uh, and then Josh Burkus uh, has his uh, script that he has up on GitHub that you can also use to, to monitor your bloat. Um, so once you see that you have your bloat, we wanna um, manage it, right? So if your indexes have grown from one gig to 10 gigs or 10 gigs to 100 gigs, for really not that much uh, data, we can either use PG Repack or you can write your own reindexing scripts. Um, it might look something kind of like this, uh, but there's might, there might be some more stuff that you want to do. And I guess the trade-off that we have to consider here is that ideally we would reindex fairly frequently because it's nice to keep your indexes, your, your index sizes manageable. But now you're consuming a lot of your disk I/O that you might want for customers to do stuff, or users to do stuff, or what have you. Uh, so when you're considering how frequently you want to do your re-indexing, you have to consider like, how often am I willing to eat the um, performance overhead associated with this maintenance operation. Uh, and one important gotcha, if you're not running 9.2, and you don't have drop index concurrently, uh, you'd better get your index, like the actual data files, out of the kernel page cache before you drop it. Um, because otherwise, you'll drop index, and the, so drop index takes out a lock on the table that you're dropping the index for. Um, but those files if, aren't actually removed immediately. You have to wait for a page cache to empty everything out. So if you're expecting drop index to run in like 100 milliseconds, and you have you know, 100 gigs of index, hanging out in memory, because you have a lot of memory or something, then uh, you might have a worse time than you think you're going to. So for stuff like this, like I would always say just you know, try it and you know, just upgrade if possible, because then you can drop index concurrently. Um, and I just note this also impacts truncate. Uh, another fun thing that, you, that I think uh, I know at least I feel like I look at a lot more these days is uh, partial indexes. I mean, the be a good way to not bloat an index with updates is to not do updates in the first place. Yay. So if you had a large table with some sort of sparsely populated column, add is not null as a condition to that index. Um, you probably don't need uh, to track like millions and millions of nulls. Uh, if, unless you're specifically querying off of that. And you also might have a, a table where you have some sort of very low cardinality column, like uh, you know, maybe you're 10% true and 90% false. You can just index your trues. And then if you need to grab all those trues, you can get them very quickly and all is well. Um, sometimes you can design for this to make it, your experience a little bit better up, up front, but as we well know, as systems grow and evolve, you don't always have the luxury of making fairly dramatic schema changes. So you might want to add something like this to make your life easier uh, in, in, the, in the meanwhile. So that's a quick run through indexes. Um, I want to talk about auto vacuum. 
Uh, auto vacuum is something I've spent a little bit more time thinking about probably recently uh, over the past, you know, maybe year and a half or, or two years or so. Um, so everybody here may be familiar with auto vacuum, but in case you're not, auto vacuum is responsible for periodically looking and seeing a lot of this table has changed. Therefore, we're going to run a vacuum operation to garbage collect up the old dead tuples, reclaim the space for Postgres. It also has this important attribute that it's going to prevent database wraparound, which is a condition that will cause the database to crash. Um, in order to support MVCC, Postgres has you know, 2 billion transactions in the future, 2 billion transactions in the past at any given time. Um, and so the side effect of that that's important to know is that you need to freeze your tuples at least every 231 or around 2 billion database transactions. Uh, and this, I think this has probably started to become talked about a little bit more in the past year just because a couple different companies had, or at least broadly outside of the you know, Postgres community, because uh, two different companies had fairly major auto vacuum related outages last year. Uh, so another important attribute of auto vacuum is that it cancels if a conflicting lock is taken unless it's to prevent wraparound. So if you get an auto vacuum and you see up in the, you know, the, uh, the query text, it'll say, you know, vacuum table, and then in parentheses it says to prevent wraparound. If it's to prevent wraparound, it will not cancel. So if I then come up and I say, alter table, table that is being vacuumed, do anything, I'm going to try and take out an exclusive lock that's blocked by that wraparound, and every query will stack up behind it. Um, this is what uh, Joint talked about in their uh, postmortem around this issue. So there are some ways you can protect yourself against this. Uh, and this is really more problematic if you're auto vacuuming almost all the time, which in large databases you might be. So you can set statement timeouts. I think lock timeout was introduced in 9.3. You can sort of add this optimistic thing ahead of time uh, if you're running DDL to say lock no wait, and if that fails, then just you know retry or whatever. Um, but if you're if you're running DDL or uh, you have any exclusive locks as part of like normal operation, uh, this can really get you. Uh, so you really do need to be careful. Otherwise, you'll uh, you know you block to some critical table and you'll take an outage. And so you have to decide, we have to decide for our own applications, like, is it better to block or is it better to fail? If you have something that says, uh, uh, I think one of the cases where it's caused problems for other people um, was uh, it, it did like create trigger if not exists or something like that. And so create trigger if not exists, like that's gonna you know, do it. Would you rather have that statement fail uh, would you rather wrap that in a lock timeout and say, okay, well, this is going to fail for some other reason? Or would you rather that actually block? So in this particular case, it sounds pretty obvious that you want that statement to fail so that traffic can continue, but that might not be the case for you if you're doing some like, more critical uh, DDL that might not be uh, quite part of normal operation. So with auto vacuums, especially when you're running them almost all the time, you really need to consider your cost limits and your cost delays. So these are the, the, the two things that you primarily tune in order, to, uh, in order to control how fast vacuums will be allowed to run. Now, just like with creating indexes, you have, uh, you know, you have limited disk I.O. available to you for ongoing operations, creating new indexes. We also have limited disk I.O. for auto vacuums. So we're incentivized because of wraparound, for this to uh, happen more quickly, but we're disincentivized due to ongoing operations uh, in order to, to, uh, to have this run too quickly and have to, uh, you know, if, if, you let, if you let this, uh, so you set it to zero, vacuum, if you set a cost delay of zero, vacuum will basically run as fast as it possibly can. You probably don't want three auto vacuums running as fast as you, they possibly can on a production system where people are trying to do stuff. That might not end well for you. Um, so lower values here are more conservative. Every cost limit operations, uh, which are values that you also configure, 
like every number of pages that it reads, it will sleep for cost delay milliseconds. So I guess in order to figure out the right values for this, you know, you need to manage, uh, you need to understand how quickly you're, uh, you're growing TX IDs. So that's like the, the age of the special dat frozen XID value in the PG database view. Um, you, need to, you, you need to consider like, okay, I'm generating X million a day, how fast do I need to auto vacuum in order to like keep that from going too far. Um, but you also need to know how much throughput you have available to you. Uh, there's tools, FIO, Bonnie++, Sysbench, et cetera, all these things that you wanna run so that you know, okay, in a naive case, like in a, in a benchmark type case, I can get X out of my system. Um, so, let's move on. And so, again, the part of why we wanna make this a little faster is like, let's say that you have a very large database or you know, you're in many terabytes, 10 terabyte plus, 20 terabyte plus, whatever. Two to the 31, I'm sorry, that says 231 billion. Two to 31 transactions uh, isn't actually that many. Uh, few orders of magnitude off there. Um, 400 transactions a second, 35 million transactions a day. You have to freeze at least 60 days. 800, 70 million transactions a day, freeze at least 30 days. And, you know, Two billion is a big number, but when you break it down like this, like 400 transactions a second is really not that many, and nor, I mean, nor is 800. I'm sure many people here have systems that peak well above that, and they might, you know, sit at these rates all day, every day. So, you know, if, if you have, find yourself in a position where you have to scan all of your, you know, you know many terabytes of data every 30 days, that's tricky, right? Like, so, so you have to look at, you know, again, come back to those cost, uh, cost delay and cost limit and make sure that you, uh, you at least have a plan. You've at least thought about it and you know you have some sort of graph, you have some sort of monitoring, some sort of alerting that's gonna tell you, uh, oh, my oldest transaction is 900 million transactions old. I might need to do something about that or my oldest transaction is 1.5 billion transactions old, you probably wanna do something about that too. So as you're monitoring this stuff, make sure you give yourself enough time to react when you start to uh, page people or otherwise have alerts that go critical. Uh, also, 9.6 will have, uh, I think, maybe a month or so ago, uh, some changes were committed that, that will prevent auto vacuum from having to scan the entire uh, table. It'll be able to skip significant portions of it. So when 9.6 comes, thanks to, uh, I know Robert Haas is one of the people that worked on that, and I know about some of the other people too, but. Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, there he is. So high five him or something. Okay, uh, so also we can manage CXID growth by, you know, Let's try to run fewer transactions. So we already do this in our code every day. We have begin, do some stuff, commit. Um, typically we talk about this as a way to logically group together things that we want to all succeed or all fail. But you know, another way to look at it is, well, these things are like generally related. I don't care as much if, they're all, if they all succeed or all fail, but I know based on my application, if this first thing fails, you know, I guess I don't, particularly care about the later operations, maybe you, you wrap that stuff in a transaction so that uh, instead of generating you know, multiple database transactions, three, one per insert, one for the update, one for the next insert, we only generate one. And so there's another case though where, the, where it does maybe warrant a little bit more thought. So in this one, many people probably have this, you might find yourself in a position where you do some work, and then you have some sort of slow application code, either intense CPU, uh, some sort of outbound network call, um, anything like that, and then you do another database transaction at the end. So we've consumed two TXIDs instead of one. 
Um, so I would typically say that this is not a very good idea, but let's say that it's not one second to two seconds, let's say it's 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds of CPU intensive work, you know, maybe that is something where you would wanna wrap the whole thing in a, in a database transaction so that you're simply using fewer TX IDs. And again, this is like something that we have to figure out based on our applications. Um, another reason why this might be dangerous is if you're using any sort of uh, transaction or connection pooling, for example, PG Bouncer running in transaction pooling mode, as soon as you say begin, you check out from your connection pool. And when you say commit or rollback or what have you, you put it back. Um, so if you say, uh, if you do something like this and you're in transaction pooling mode in PG Bouncer or whatever your uh, connection pooler is, you know, you could get to a point where, you know, all of your database connections are in use even though you're not actually waiting on the database. So like I said, like I don't typically recommend this, but I think when you're, when you do find yourself generating a ton of TX IDs, maybe it is something that you should consider um, in order to turn, like, say in the slow application code, maybe you do five outbound network calls and you like log a small piece of data for all of them. You can add, you know, you can ex consume one TX ID for each of those pieces of information that you're logging, or you can consume one if you're willing to eat the overhead of begin and commit around the whole thing. So I guess next, I wanna talk a little bit about replication. So I have a little blurb from the documentation here. Sorry to put a wall of text on a slide. Um, typically we wanna operate our databases with synchronous commit. That means that when you commit a transaction, you are confirmed, flushed to stable storage uh, before returning, uh, returning the commit. If you combine this with synchronous standby names though, which is a feature of streaming replication, um, you're actually waiting on a remote F-sync. So you're waiting on an F-sync on your synchronous standby servers. So that turns out to be fairly not performant sometimes, uh, particularly if you write out a lot of wall very quickly, vacuum, create S concurrently, this can cause a problem because you might, you know, you might get bottlenecked waiting on your remote F-sync. So there are ways to deal with this, but again, these are things that we have to ask ourselves about like our app as they get bigger. Do we say, well, would I rather turn off synchronous commit uh, by, or would I rather just turn off synchronous standby names? I can set synchronous commit to local in 9.2 and later. You can set remote write, which waits for a write acknowledgement, doesn't, but doesn't wait for a flush on the other side. Uh, I don't know. I think, you know, it's sort of the, the old question of would I rather be, you know, dead and 100% right or alive and 99.9 or potentially 99.999% right? Um, these are hard questions to answer. Uh, so, oops, I didn't see that slide, sorry. Yeah, so and the, the most meaningful trade-off with something like this is what happens if your primary crashes? You have high availability infrastructure set up to stand up your standby, which might be streaming and typically might be synchronous streaming, but oh, you disabled that for some reason. And now you find that, oh, I had 10 milliseconds of data loss or something. Maybe that's okay for you, maybe it's not. Um, but if you, I mean, you need to ask yourself whether that's all right and you might, you know, monitor your uh, receive lag in order to kind of see what you think the normal exposure is. Um, but a good feature to help with some of this stuff would be if you could have, if we had a maintenance cost delay and a maintenance cost limit, it's not something that Postgres has today. The idea being that create index concurrently instead of flooding the wall, waiting for flushes on the other side, maybe we can artificially slow that down so that it doesn't uh, block out other kind of real-time queries that are trying to, um, that are trying to do work. Um, and actually, also, a more broad QoS might be interesting as well, where you can set values like this so you have, um, you know, maybe 
uh, more OLAP type queries, you want to uh, tune down the priority so that the more real time stuff can go through faster if you're forced to run things like that on the same system, et cetera. I don't know what that would look like though. Um, Oh, really? Yeah. I've not, I'm not sure that, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. so there are hypotheses that other types of queries, aside from vacuum, would obey the vacuum cost delay, and it is thought to not be true, but hopefully it will be soon. Um, I think actually having a separate, I guess if you, if you had, if it did obey vacuum cost delay, you could set that per session. Uh, but otherwise maybe you could, maybe you, we don't actually need a separate, a separate concept. Um, but if so, then vacuum cost delay should probably be renamed to maintenance cost delay or something. Uh, so I'm trying to move a little quickly to get back on time. Uh, uh, so just a couple other little quick things I want to touch on just at the very end. Um, you know, obviously, we should have backups. That would be a good idea, right? Um, but specific, really the last thing on here is, is really important. Uh, we use caution when rolling your own incremental backups. Uh, there are, you probably want incremental backups if your databases are large, because otherwise your store, like maybe 50% of your database changes when you, uh, every week, so then you take your next weekly backup, you could save a lot of space. But uh, David Steele actually does a really good lightning talk. I don't know if he'll do it at this conference, but he demonstrates this behavior where rsync is only accurate to the second. And so when you, um, if you're not using a tool that is aware of this, pro of this problem, uh, that'll like take a manifest beforehand and after, et cetera, and you don't use uh, rsync checksums, then you can actually get data corruption uh, if you just use an rsync to take your backup. So use a tool, use barman, use pg backrest, use whatever you want, um, ZFS or SAN snapshots if you have fancy storage. Um, but otherwise, you know, you can get, you can find yourself kind of screwed here. And then just sort of lastly, uh, there are great tools out here to do a lot of this monitoring. Um, I mentioned check Postgres before. If you have your Nagios, you have uh, whatever you, you use to handle your, your monitoring, uh, check Postgres will do index bloat, dat frozen XID. It'll monitor things like the number of archive ready files. So if your uh, if your wall archiving fails unexpectedly, you get something that's a little bit more meaningful than my X log volumes filling up. Um, and then I use I like Collecti and Graphite because I've been using it for a really long time. Um, but then you want us to look at these things to see like disk space, particularly your growth rate, replication lag. Postgres gives you a wealth of information there and in the PG stat uh, tables just generally. So uh, the more of this stuff that you can you know, monitor and make sure that there's not a change, because if you go look and you say, what's my lag right now, you really need to know, well, what was the lag before? Do I normally sit at one millisecond and now I'm at 10? Do I normally sit at five and now I'm at 100? Uh, the change is really what's important to, uh, to look at. So these are some of the tools that I've, uh, I've found are really, really helpful. Um, and very easy to use, um, generally. So I guess quick conclusions. Uh, Postgres is a really great foundation. Like I've certainly used it for a long time, like I said. Rommel um, said at his keynote last PGConf uh, with this really amazing pasta analogy, pasta as a sauce delivery platform, Postgres as an application delivery platform. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's, that's what it is, and so, you know, our applications, you know, in order to deliver the applications as best we can, like we use Postgres, we make trade-offs, there's no silver bullet. Sometimes we say, I'd rather have more complexity and more performance alongside it. Sometimes you say, I don't care about this thing taking five extra milliseconds because developers can understand it better, you know. So there's no perfect solution. Uh, it's always gonna be challenging. And these are just some of the things that I've, uh, I've had to think about, I've found over the last several years. So that is all I have. Um, any questions?
Going once, going twice. Uh, yeah, probably um, uh, probably balancing auto vacuum speed. You know, so making like you can't be too aggressive because then all of a sudden your real time stuff starts to fail. But if you're too unaggressive, then your transaction ID, uh, the age of your frozen ID, slowly creeps up. And it is, it is slow, you know, it's not, you're not gonna find yourself, oh goodness, I'm at like 1.5 billion now. Uh, you'll say, hey, I'm like going up by a couple million every few days, and it just sort of slowly, you know, goes up. So you have to look at it at like really long time scales in order to see some of that, but then when you do, you know this is a thing that I can do to tune it. So. Yes? Uh, so in a previous life, I worked on a database that was uh, uh, where we had max connections set like very unreasonably high. It was the 8.4, and I think that max. I think that somebody um, at that there thought that it was a good idea to set it to you know several hundred, like eight or nine hundred or something like that. So that didn't work out super well. Um, but yeah, I think I mentioned uh, transaction pooling specifically. You know. In many applications, you're doing a lot of stuff that's not talking to the database. So if you use a connection pooler kind of local to your node, then you just you overcommit your application threads or workers or what have you on top of something like PG Bouncer or lots, you know, a JDBC connection pool or what have you. Yeah. So like you're definitely incentivized to keep the number of active connections really far down. And I think I think generally speaking too, it's better to block at like have somebody blocked waiting for a connection than it is to overload the database with too many connections. I, I like, so that's sort of situational. I think you can either run it uh, on your application server. So if you have 100 application servers, maybe you only permit a small number of database connections per application server. And then however many worker threads you run per server, they, they're gated right there. Obviously you can do it a lot more efficiently if you run it on the database, but then you, you sort of have this other problem which is like PG Bouncer is uh, uh, evented and it's not free. Like it does have overhead with it. So if you're running you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of queries per second, like PG Bouncer will give you meaningful overhead. Yeah, so you might wanna spread that out. One more, or, you, or are we good? I think we're pretty much on the time. Okay, great. And I have one more question for you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you very much.